Black Star Network is this. Oh, no punches! A real uh, revolutionary right now. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I 
Thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Stay black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today is Wednesday, January 11th, 2023. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Congress passed a new rule, Republican-led House. The Republican-led House has passed a new rule banning the mayor of D.C., Muriel Bowser, from the House floor. Yeah. We'll talk about how trifling this is. Also, we'll speak to the first black female justice in Michigan's state court. Michigan Justice Kyra Harris-Bolden will join us to discuss her historic appointment. A Texas community is remaining a recreation renaming a recreation center after Atiana Jefferson, the black woman killed by a white police officer in Fort Worth. Also, calls are growing louder for newly elected disgraced Congressman George Santos of Long Island to resign. This time, Democrats and Republicans are saying, yeah, you gotta go. Also, continuing our uh, fit live, uh, first of all, I knew you uh, in 2023. We'll talk with um, uh, fitness expert Funk Roberts, who specializes in helping men over 50, 40 and 50 uh, stay fit. So look forward to that conversation, y'all. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Now that Republicans are in control of the U.S. House, they are changing the rules. And one of those rules, they are preventing uh, the mayor of Washington, D.C. from having access to the House floor. But it's not just her. Uh, it's also uh, folks uh, from Puerto Rico uh, and other territories. Again, uh, so Republicans made the change on Monday night when they passed the new House Rules Package. The change bans Bowser, as well as the governor from U.S. territories like Puerto Rico, from being on the floor. Although the move will not impact Bowser's mayoral duties, Democrats believe it sends a clear political message. The new rules grant 17 categories of people, including governors and foreign ministers. Uh, a. Scott Bolden is a lawyer here in D.C., Joe Richardson, civil rights attorney, uh, as well as Monique Presley, legal analyst and host of Make It Make Sense with Monique Presley. Glad to have all three of you here. Uh, Scott... 
Okay, so, so for people who don't understand, the reality is Washington, D.C., of course, we know, is not a state. And so Congress... It should uh, be. Well, we know it should be. Congress has authority. And so what typically happens is when Democrats are in control, they treat Washington, D.C. and its elected officials a lot differently than Republicans do. Yet, when there's something that Republicans want, then they'll oppose their will. So, so for instance, when Republicans supported uh, opportunity vouchers uh, for folks to be able to take uh, public dollars and go to private schools, they passed that law... Uh, governing Washington, D.C., and so you've always had this back and forth over how Republicans treat leadership in Washington, D.C., compared to Democrats. Which is why they won't uh, pass the necessary legislation for statehood, because eight out of every ten people in D.C. Uh, are Democrats. But they have no problem when we save them on January 6th, when the Capitol Police needed the help the most, it was the D.C. police that were there, and our tax dollars at work. It is also why they will not allow us to tax at the source of income, 60% to 70% of every individual who's in Washington nine to five during the week is a Maryland and Virginia resident, and we lose those tax revenues. But that's another issue. The message being sent here by the Republicans is complete nonsense, if you will. She's always the, the mayor of uh, the District of Columbia can be on the floor for any number of reasons as the guest of both Republican and Democrats. And so uh, it's more pettiness on the part of the Republicans. That's why we don't have statehood. That's why we are indentured servants to America and why we obviously continue to rely on the federal government because they will not allow us to uh, be self-actualizing uh, self as a jurisdictional entity. Uh, Monique, uh, again, Republicans are showing, you know, who they are by being, as Scott said, petty. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Happy New Year, Scott. <laughs> well, you should try to know by now how to operate a computer. You, when you ain't no, here to talk about your bag, I'm here, just letting you know. Here he comes. Here he comes helping. Roland is the host, Scott. Listen, um, they're not just petty, right? They're racist. And this oh, seems goodness. petty. This, this seems like, you know, petty with no purpose. But as Scott said, yes, indentured servants, yes, District of Columbia is, is left-leaning, is heavily democratic, is chocolate still, even with all of the, the gentrification, um, and amelioration, still chocolate. So when they do these things, what they are saying is no black folks for us, right? It's not just about politics. It's not just about a vote. It is about taxation without representation. And they won't even enable um, the, the leader who should be governor for the District of Columbia to be there where the action happens, even though it's not like she could have a vote it's not like unless she was called upon, she could have a say. But there are many things that are not covered uh, that need to be covered. You know, they're doing all of this, asking for C-SPAN to have more reach with its cameras, et cetera, and so on. There are things that directly affect the District of Columbia every single day. Decisions about federal dollars, decisions about federal buildings, uh, decisions about the way that income is generated and the things that Scott pointed out. And they want her, because she is effective, they want her out. Uh, Joe, uh, the first of all, uh, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, she is the D.C. representative uh, in Congress. Uh, and again, when the Democrats are in charge, she actually gets a vote. Well, uh, Republicans in charge, uh, we see how that changes. They're showing us exactly who they are. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, and, and Happy New Year, everybody. And Monique st stole my term, taxation without representation. You know, that's just, that's just what... This describe. I mean, this describes this clearly, and it's their term. It's the reason why America was founded. And fundamentally speaking, I mean, we all know we can see that uh, you know they'll never want D.C. statehood because that guarantees two extra black senators. That guarantees an uh, 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 area being represented and making a difference. Uh, that it, that is it is. Um, of America where we're going 101, right? We talk about 12, 2043. Well, it's 
been done happened at Washington, D.C., right? There's always been majority minority, always mostly black folks. And so, therefore, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who, who has been a D.C. representative for 30 years or more, I remember seeing her in 1992 when I was working with Congresswoman Waters, uh, they've been fighting the good fight. And by and large, you know, until the mid-'90s, most of the time, the Democrats had the House. And so, even while they were kind of going along the road with some of these things, um, they could still be there. They weren't flushed out uh, just because uh, they were black and they reminded them of a reality that's a little bit closer uh, than the Republicans actually wanted to be. But here we are again, right? Uh, and, you know, I, I guess the, the, the thing that we can take solace in, our silver lining is, um, that the Republicans, I, I, I sense, could continue to uh, make the mistakes and, and have the fumbles uh, that will uh, prescribe this as just a two-year problem. Well, uh, these are American citizens. That's who they are. Folks in, folks in Puerto Rico, they are American citizens. And you see how Republicans treat American citizens. They don't particularly want to have a vote uh, in Congress because, again, they're scared those are going to be blue territories and hey. not red territories. All right, folks. Got hey, Roland, the uh, GOP may not know that they're American citizens. Well, no, they don't no, know it. Trust me, they, they know, but we know how, but we know how ugly <laughs> uh, they are. All right, hold tight one second. We'll talk politics more when we come back as they continue to go after President Joe Biden. We'll tell you about that. If you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, senior check and money orders, the P.O. Box 57196. Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. And Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Uh, and be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. In fact, folks in St. Louis, I will see you on January 21st at 3 p.m. the St. Louis Area Urban League. I'll be discussing my book, and I'll be questioning about it by Mike McMillan, who leads this uh, Urban League, as well as my man Tef Poe. So looking forward to coming to St. Louis. And so mark your calendar. It's going to be free and open to the public. You guys can get your book. I'll be signing copies as well. So make a note. In St. Louis on uh, the 21st of January. That's a Saturday after next. Uh, and uh, really looking forward to it. So St. Louis, let's do something. Folks, but if you're not there, order your book from a bookstore. Download the copy from Audible. Order through your favorite black bookstore. All right, folks, I'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us. They think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. So people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Coleman. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, everybody. This is Jonathan Nelson. Hi, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph, and you are watching Roland Martin, unfiltered.
Well, the House Republicans opened their long-promised investigation into President Joe Biden and his family with the power of their new majority in the House. Demands for information from the Treasury Department and former Twitter executives are beginning to lay the groundwork for public hearings. The House Oversight Committee sent letters to the Treasury Department requiring flagged suspicious financial transactions by members of the Biden family. Lawmakers also want testimony from multiple former Twitter executives involved in the company's fi uh, handling of an October 2020 story from the New York Post about Hunter Biden. Republicans claim the story was suppressed for political reasons. So um, we can expect more of these uh, shenanigans, uh, Monique, taking place uh, over the next two years, as long as the Republicans are in control of the House. Uh, and you know what? What the heck? Hey, I, I, of course, Biden is not going to do it, but be fair play. Hell, fight them the, fight them the way Trump did. Don't give them a damn thing. Right. No, I mean, he's he's not going to do that. It's going to be different because he's not going to have anything to give. So that's a different story. Um, they will they will cooperate as much as they can cooperate. But there's not going to be reams and reams of evidence in the ivory tower. There's not going to be reams and reams of documents. And I'll probably talk about that later from Mar-a-Lago all the way to House offices. Um, that's not going to happen. The thing that concerns me about this is the thing that always concerns me. This is happening from the fiscally responsible party, right? These are the people who don't believe in wasting money, don't believe in wasting taxpayer dollars, want to decrease government spending and financing for useless, wasteful things. But here they are. That's all they really care about doing. And it's not by accident. And it's not just petty. I'm not going to talk about racism right now. I'm going to talk about another thing that is their problem. They have no ideas. They don't have big ideas. They don't have small ideas. They have no way, really, that they have considered in order to take America forward. So they have to fill the time with something, and this is this is it. Joe, uh, it, it, and again, I, I, I'm just trying to tell people it's going to be more of this. It's going to be more childish behavior, more pettiness, uh, and we're going to see that. Uh, and and what the what the American people are going to show? Oh, y'all actually had no agenda. Oh, you actually didn't want to get anything done. First of all, they already, with their decision to try to repeal the funding for the 87,000 new IRS agents, first of all, which would be hired over 10 years, not like it's going to, they're going to be hired next year, they, by that decision, it will decrease the amount of money the IRS brings in, and so their decision will actually increase the deficit by $100 billion, but... They claim they believe in slashing the deficit. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you want to slash the deficit, start off with all of these tax breaks that you've got. You know, now you you want to have a fight on the on, on the floor about, uh, you know, well, you've got to do cuts to go along with it. We won't agree with the debt ceiling increase and all these other things. Well, that was a discussion to start at the beginning. Now, if you go back to the last platform uh, for the Republican Party when Trump was uh, elected, well, nominated for re-election, there was no platform. So they're letting you know that they have no agenda. They've created a committee about uh, uh, try to see um, about, you know, the distrust of government. I forget what it is that they call it, you know, with Jim <laughs> Jordan uh, dealing with that. And so I think that, again, the, the Republicans are going to give us a lot of help uh, to help us keep office, uh, maybe even despite ourselves in a moment uh, on the Democratic side, and to get the House back. But here's what the Democrats have to do. Democrats have to make sure their narrative is what it needs to be. We are very poor at narrative. 
Now, we've gotten some help. It's looked better lately. You know, we used to say a few months ago, we were talking about how the Republicans keep it all together. They get power, and then they dole it out, and they stay together. Uh, and right now, it looks like the Dems are the ones that are staying together, because that was really a crap show uh, last week. And Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans are not any better for, for, for doing it. Um, these 20 are going to hold strong for their folks that, that elect them who don't want them to get anything done or didn't send them to get anything done, okay? And then we have to make sure that the narrative is what it needs to be so people blame the folks and the party that needs to be blamed for it. So, yeah, so we'll see how it all goes, uh, but the narrative is there uh, to be told that these guys don't have an agenda, they don't want to accomplish anything. And at the end of the day, I would like to think that the American people aren't going to be pleased with that when we still are bringing inflation down, even though there's been progress, when we still are doing things uh, that need to be done and people are hurting. And so we'll see how well we tell that story. Well, you know what? I I I'll say this, Scott. The reason I think uh, you're going to see a, a difference when we talk about this narrative uh, is because Hakeem Jeffries is now the Democratic leader. Um, mm -hmm. uh, look, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who never appeared on this show, um, you know, she didn't do a lot of interviews. She really wasn't uh, out there uh, being very vocal. Uh, in fact, uh, here is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries uh, eviscerating, going after the Republicans with regards to their bill where they want to enact a national ban on abortion. Watch this. You come to the floor. As part of your march to criminalize abortion care, to impose a nationwide ban, to set into motion government mandated pregnancies. So that's the distinction for today. As Democrats, we believe in a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions, period, full stop. A decision that should be between a woman, her family, and her doctors. Period. Full stop. We believe in Roe v. Wade. You wonder about our position? That's it. The Women's Health Protection Act. That's it. Freedom to make your own reproductive health care decisions. That's it. As compared to a clear effort that's what this bill is about today, a march toward criminalizing abortion care. Um, I think, uh, again, Scott, I think it's going to be a little different when you talk about messaging for the Democrats with Jeffries as the leader. Well, I think the White House should uh, follow suit and learn a lot from Hakeem Jeffries. He's going to be not only out there speaking early, but often, but he's an articulate eloquent and passionate voice for what the, it means to be a Democrat in this country. Um, you know, the, the White House messaging has to be better on this. The Republicans are, are all about power and about fighting and what have you. The bread and butter issues that they ran on in the midterms, this is not what they are trying to make this country better on. They're trying to do investigations. And I think the White House ought to treat these investigations as annoyances, right? Nuances, uh, well, not nuances, but annoyances um, in, in regard to cooperating or not cooperating. Because the focus, that can get going on in the background. The Democrats have to message that we're about making America better, fixing America's problems, and the bread and butter issues with the party for that. The Republicans will implode notwithstanding these investigations because of that far-right extreme uh, Freedom Caucus that has always can change, as I understand the rules, might be able to change speakers at any time, if you will, with just one person complaining. And so the Democrats have to stay above this fray. They cannot get down with the, with the clowns and the circus. They've got to stay above the fray <laughs> and message that they're really the best uh, party to lead uh, uh, America, but, and I but, think but, you're going to see this because but, but, of the Republicans. But you got to fight, though. I mean, you still, you still got to fight back. Yeah, you fight back annoyances for sure, right? But you do it in a way where you're not down there fighting with idiots. You want this document, okay? <laughs> we'll give you this document, and then you message 
that document, you message what it means, and you message how petty and, and um, inappropriate it is or, or the meaninglessness of it all. For example, with Biden's documents, the uh, security documents that were found, right? I think they handled that just right. They voluntarily turned it over to DOJ. He says, hey, I don't know what this is, but we did these, we went through this procedure. That's what it is. The Republicans can yell and scream and say, this is the same as Trump. It's not the same as Trump. Messaging, messaging, messaging. And they don't have to get down and fight the Republicans over these security documents that Biden had, because they'll try to do the comparative. You, it's nuanced messaging. You give them what they want and then ignore them while opposing them in a way that is far more sophisticated than what the Republicans are showing America with their clown show last week and their clown show with these investigations. Uh, I, I don't know. He, he, here's my whole deal. Uh, look. But well, what do you want to do? Fight, yell, and scream and look just Scott, like Scott, them? Scott, you Scott, Scott, Scott. If you listen, you'll know. Every well, time, really? every time Jim Jordan opens, opens his mouth, I would say... Ain't you the same one who ignored the subpoena for January 6th? Oh, so mm -hmm. now you believe in the rule of law. Every time they try that, I would hit them with something along those lines by saying, oh, so now y'all care about subpoenas. Now you care about congressional committees. Now you care about this here. Play their own words and smack them in the head with their words. Got to go to a break. Yeah, but hypocrisy only will get Scott, you so Scott, far. Scott, 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 I, hey, I told you, Where's Scott, I was clear on what I said. Now, coming up next, <laughs> we're going to talk to the first black woman to serve on the Michigan State Supreme Court. Uh, look forward to having a conversation with her. Uh, that's right, folks. Uh, it's a sister now on that Supreme Court, and she'll join us next. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, the number of people working from home has quadrupled to almost 30% you're going to learn how you can now create your money space. It can impact your mood, your mindset, and your ability to get wealthy. Interior designer Nikki Kluge joins us to share exactly what you need to do to create a winning workspace. Make a space that is going to instantly put you in the mindset so that you can be more productive, so that you're organized, so that you're inspired, or you're really focusing in on the task at hand. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Sips at the bottom. Oh, okay. Sipping you off with your mic. <laughs> like I'm sending you, <laughs> sending you off to school. <laughs> I, I have to do this for Justice Bernstein every time we take the bench, and now you have. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the history was made at the top of the year, folks, when the great-granddaughter of a lynching victim became the first black woman associate justice 
on the Michigan State Supreme Court. Kyra Harris Bolden was sworn in as the first black female justice in Michigan State Court's 185 year history. She was appointed to the high court by Governor Gretchen Whitmer last year. Bolden, an experienced former criminal defense attorney, will succeed Justice Bridget Mary McCormick, who retired last year. By Bolden is one of seven uh, uh, seven female uh, justices uh, in the state. She joins uh, me now. Justice Bolden, how you doing? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Well, you couldn't help but smile when we played that video there of them uh, trying to get your robe. I mean, that still has to be uh, uh, a, a new, wonderful feeling for you. It, it is, it is. And I was smiling because um, I, whenever I see my daughter in that clip, it's just so... Um, it, it, it just brings tears to my eyes. And I'm sitting in her room because she usurped my office. So, <laughs> <laughs> so these are the books behind me, but... Um, but hold no. up, hold up. How, how are you on the Supreme Court and, and she usurping... You, you, you ain't got the authority at the, at the crib? No, no, everything is about my daughter now. So she took over my office so she could have a place to sleep. I think that was a good decision. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, it, it, it is, uh, first of all, people don't understand me. You actually were, you were running for the Supreme Court, correct? Yes, uh, that's I correct. I spent the better part of last year running for the court. Uh, while I was pregnant, um, I had a baby um, midway through the campaign, um, and I finished the campaign with a newborn. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and, and now, of course, uh, then the governor appoints you to the position. And, and one of the things that is important, we've seen this with President Joe Biden on the federal level, uh, former defense attorneys, former public defenders, uh, being appointed judges. All too often in American history, when we look at judges, whether they've been federal judges, whether they've been, they've been on, the, on the state Supreme Court, any levels, they've been largely white men who were prosecutors. Yes, yes. Um, and I am very different from that, <laughs> obviously. Um, you know, being someone that is, uh, would be considered young, being someone that is a new mom, uh, someone that is a descendant of a lynching victim um, and being the first black woman on our Michigan Supreme Court in 2023, uh, it is um, unacceptable. <laughs> it is unacceptable. I'm proud to be that representation, but um, it, it is time uh, for representation like this um, across our country. Oh, a a absolutely. And, and, and the reason I bring that up, uh, because, you know, there's a, the sign over the Supreme Court that is etched in stone, equal justice under law. And the fact of the matter is, we know as African-Americans, that has not been the case since the inception of this country. And when you begin to diversify the bench, uh, not only when it comes to uh, color, not only when it comes to gender, when it comes to experience, then you're bringing a different perspective. We've already seen that with Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. She came out the gate on the U.S. Supreme Court uh, with her questions. She didn't play the usual, let me just sit back and be quiet and just be happy I'm here. Uh, no. I mean, she came out bringing all of that perspective to the Supreme Court on day one. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so important. Um, so... The, the voice of a black woman has not been represented on the highest court in the state of Michigan until now. And I, I understand that weight. And when you create space and bring different perspectives, um, you know, I, I think something wonderful happens. It's so important to have a diversity of perspectives, backgrounds and experiences at that table because they're making, well, we are making decisions, it's my first day. Uh, uh, we are making decisions that really affect the lives of Michiganders for generations to come. And so it's important to have that diverse voice at the table to make sure you're bringing in all the experiences of Michiganders when we're making these very, very important decisions. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, as, as, I, as, as I think back, and, and, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well, is when you, when you look at uh, this state, and, and most people, again, when they look at Michigan, people think, oh, Michigan, blue state, it's uh, you know, blue collar, you got black folks in Detroit, 
uh, but there's a whole lot of red uh, in, in, in Michigan as well. And then we saw in the last couple of years where you had um, a decision by the voters when it came to redrawing congressional lines. We saw this year how the courts ruled when it came to the issue of abortion being on the ballot. Um, for years, we've heard conservatives complain about, you know, activist judges. But we're seeing, um, you know, uh, we, we, we're seeing what is happening uh, with other courts as well. Uh, if you could describe your um, judicial philosophy, what would that be? So that's really interesting. Obviously, get asked that question a lot. Um, I think maybe because I am on the younger side, I have said over and over again, for me, um, I don't want to put myself in a box and to tell people that I'm going to look at every single case in the exact same manner. I don't think that's fair to Michiganders. And so I want to take in as much information as possible and make the best decisions possible. Um, and that may be different philosophies and different methods um, depending upon the case. But I think each case deserves its own unique set of eyes um, and that's one thing that I think is also unique that I bring to the table as well. Um, when we talk about the law, um, we are seeing, and I think people are, are seeing that, we, we always hear about, oh, it's important to get elected officials uh, in place because we can change a law or pass new laws. Uh, but in this country, there are three branches of government, uh, and that is, the, uh, that is legislative, there's the executive, and then there is the judicial. Uh, and, and I have long said, my TV One show, this show here, to African Americans, we cannot overlook and ignore the importance of judges. Absolutely. It's so important. So with my own family history that you mentioned earlier, my great-grandfather, uh, Jesse Lee Bond, was lynched in Tennessee in 1939 after asking a store owner for a receipt. Uh, and a lynch mob ensued, and he was beaten and castrated and thrown into the local river. Um, and the coroner deemed it an accidental drowning. Wow. As a result, his murderers walked free. And so that really inspired me to get involved in the justice system, but also just underscores the importance of the judiciary, uh, because that is your last resort. And for us here in Michigan, the Michigan Supreme Court is literally the last court you can go to uh, for a resolution. And so it, it's incredibly important um, to know who your justices are um, that and know their perspectives and know their backgrounds. And so I am very honored to be in this position, um, to be a representation for so many that have not seen this type of representation. Um, there is a little girl that I met over the past year, and her name is Kyra as well, and I just saw her in an event yesterday, and the way that she looked at me, um, she just beamed. And that really warms my heart because it's not just about the representation at the table that we're able to have at the Michigan Supreme Court, but it's all of the young boys and girls that now know that they can aspire to be on the highest court in the state of Michigan and on the United States Supreme Court. Um, I think that is something that is extremely important. Uh, you talked about that history uh, and the perspective. I think back to Thurgood Marshall, um, who talked about uh, what it was like for him uh, being on that Supreme Court and bringing that experience to bear. Uh, oftentimes, when cases come forward, uh, there are judges who take a very 30,000 feet from above, standoffish, just sort of, this is what the law says, and not taking into account uh, the, the human reality uh, that, uh, that, that exists. And so, when you think about your experience uh, and what you've done in your career, how does that also help you when you're going to be sitting there making those uh, judicial decisions? Oh, it's, it's invaluable. So before I was appointed and ran for um, office for the Supreme Court, um, I was a legislator in the state of Michigan, um, representing my hometown of Southfield, which is a majority minority community, um, about 70 to 80 percent black. And so I, I bring that with me. I have been a public servant for the past four years. Um, I know how impactful our laws are um, as a result. Um, before that, I was a litigator. And before that, I was a judicial law clerk uh, for a judge in uh, Detroit. And so I absolutely understand how our laws 
impact everyday people. And that's why I'm so fortunate to have that voice at the table because um, I, I know that each case affects people and that perspective really is helpful when making decisions. Uh, hold on one second. I've got a panel of lawyers. They absolutely are salivating at being able just to ask you some questions. Uh, and, <laughs> and somebody sent me a text asking me, you, black folks will, send, will see, you gotta understand, you don't have to deal with this. Black people will just text me while I'm working in the middle of the show. Uh, and somebody texts me asking, uh, is she an AKA, is she a Delta, what is she? I, 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 I am a woman of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority incorporated okay all right so i'm just so just so, like again that's the kind of text i get from folks so hold tight one second uh we come back uh, our panel uh, of lawyers uh want to ask you uh some questions as well folks we're talking with uh kyra harris bolden the first black woman to sit on the michigan state supreme court uh we're glad to have her here uh you're watching roland martin unfiltered on the black star network see this is also why we do this folks uh for stories like this here uh, of course, jo you can join us by downloading the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also join our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do stories like this to travel around the country. I'm going to be in Houston tomorrow, uh, broadcasting outside of the Houston Independent School District, uh, where we're fighting uh, the attempted firing of uh, Tiffany Guillory, the principal at my high school, Jack Hayes High School, so we'll be there. Uh, and so you can support us by sending a check and money order. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Cash App, Dallas Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, Roland at Roland S. Martin.com. Roland at Roland Martin Unfiltered.com. And be sure to get your copy of my book, White Fear How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Next, A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. Listen to this. Good fortune happens when opportunity meets planning. In other words, success is no accident. Thomas Edison said that, and it's such a great message as we enter into this new year. Planning for success and balance in 2023, planning for it, and then how to live it. I'm always working towards those goals. I'm always moving in that direction. And if something gets me off track for the goal, I hurry up and determine, oh, wait, you're off track. Get back over here on your track of what you're supposed to be doing, and I continue to work to those goals. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Amber Stevens West from The Carmichael Show. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. We're talking with uh, Michigan State Supreme Court Justice uh, Kyra Harris Bolden. Uh, let's go to my panel of uh, lawyers. Uh, I guess I was, hold up, see, see Monique thinks she's going to get the first question. No, you're not, because uh, you got the first one in the last segment. So Joe gets the first question. Yep, yep, sorry. See, I know you over there. I never waiting, get the first question. I didn't even get <laughs> to answer uh, the uh, last uh, one. Uh, 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 see, not one of y'all is the host. Not, not now one of y'all is the host, so calm down. Go, I Joe. I didn't even get a turn. Go, Joe. <laughs> 
That's Justin sexist. Harris. Not letting her do it. Joe, y'all taking Joe's time. Trouble. Joe, go. Justice Harris Bolden. I have to start off by saying how incredibly proud uh, we are of you. I am individually all the way here from California. I want you to hear my spirit and understand that I, I, I told my daughter to watch this. She's doing noobs interning in, in Myrtle Beach. I said, when you get home, you, you watch and rewind this. So that's the first thing is our, our heart is just so warmed by watching you and seeing you. But let me ask you, what can you tell us just in general about the appellate process, how things get to the Michigan Supreme Court? Kind of a one-on-one -on -one for people that don't know. Are there certain things that there's original jurisdiction with the Supreme Court, or is it always trial and then appellate and then Supreme Court? How does that happen? So the Michigan Supreme Court is a court of last resort, um, and it is an appellate court. Um, which means you have to go th through your district or your circuit court, um, go to your court of appeals, and then you have to appeal from the court of appeals. But 98, or roughly about 98% of cases will stop at the court of appeals. And so the Michigan Supreme Court will hear about 2% of mostly the most important cases. Um, now, there are some cases that get expedited review because of their time sensitive. You know, those would be kind of your election issues and things like that. But for the most part, I think maybe what people uh, might not know about this job is one of the most important parts of this job is just deciding which cases are taken up um, mm -hmm. and having that voice at the table so that people can even get that shot to, to present their case before the Supreme Court is incredibly important. And that's why it's incredibly important uh, to uh, have uh, justices on the Michigan or on whatever Supreme Court, but justices on the Michigan Supreme Court that you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, right. Such an honor to talk to you. All right, Monique. Your Honor, congratulations. Uh, I am I am excited and and just so proud. And here's my question: There are girls rising. Uh, there there are young women to be who desire to have the opportunity and to serve in the manner that you are now blessed to be able to serve. What suggestions do you have for them for a path? What would you say to the 11 year old who's just starting to figure out, I think I see myself there? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. Um, my, uh, the, the thing that I can, can communicate that was very important to me in my success are mentors. So I stand on the shoulders of all of the black women that have come before me that have uh, broken broken down doors and, and, and chipped away that glass ceiling for me to be here. Um, so I just want to be clear, I would not be here if it wasn't for uh, black women wrapping their arms around me and pushing me uh, and to, to this position. Um, but just thankful for every single mentor um, that has guided me, that has given me great advice throughout my career. Um, I would say that's the most important thing. Get people who you trust that are in positions that you want to be in um, and, and really create that relationship because it has really been invaluable to me. Thank you. Scott? Uh, Justice Bolden, congratulations. I know we're related, like all black people are, since we share the same last name. She ain't claiming you at all. Yes, she is. <laughs> if she looked at my legal background, she would be proud, I think. But That's this the, is hold your on. Show. The operative phrase there is, I think. This is your show. My dad was a state yeah, court can. judge in <laughs> Illinois, and just congratulations. I heard an interview with CNN, and they, they, they were trying to put you in a box because you're a former legislator, and then your new job as a Supreme Court justice. I thought your answer was excellent because this is a different job. But my question has to do with whether you think being a former criminal defense lawyer, being a former legislator, and now uh, deciding judicial cases where independent legal thought and judgment on your part is very different than those other opportunities or those other uh, jobs you had, is that going to be an asset or will it, will it be difficult for you to separate the politics and your criminal defense background from your judicial uh, decision-making? 
Um, so I think it only enhances it. So most people that are judges or justices um, have worked in the legal field. A lot of them have been prosecutors. Um, and I have a different experience being a judicial law clerk and being a legislator. And what I have always said was when you're talking about legislative interpretation, how better to get at what the legislature intended than to have a former legislator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. um, I think my right. different <laughs> is an asset to the bench. Um, and, and I'm yeah. reviewing cases and I'm thinking, um, you know, how things were done in the legislature. Currently, nobody else on the yeah. Michigan Supreme Court has that experience. And I'm um, very happy to share my experience with my colleagues. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you, of course, uh, you just started, but you did have to start with some bit of a controversy. Uh, you named someone as a clerk uh, who had a past a shooting a, a police officer in 1994, rehabilitated themselves. Uh, this caused a controversy. He resigned. Another justice was highly critical of you, who has now apologized to you for it. He, he, here's what I don't understand about that whole thing. How can we sit here? How, how can a legal system, how can this public talk about if you commit a crime, you serve your time, and then you are to rehabilitate yourself? That's what this individual did, and now being penalized for it, um, you made the decision to hire them, of course, accepted his resignation, but I thought that's what we are encouraging folks to do. That is to better themselves after they have made a mistake. So I picked um, a great group of um, staffers, um, and that includes people with diversity of background, perspectives, um, education, um, and I think it's important to have all of those experiences at the table, particularly people that have been marginalized uh, in the past. Um, and so we are moving forward. We are going to make sure that we're um, making the best decisions possible. Um, but, you know, I think it's important for people that come from marginalized backgrounds and communities to have a seat at the highest court in the state of Michigan. Um, again, that's uh, the bottom line is we should be encouraging folks again to uh, to to really to really. Um, uh, it, I just thought it was just it, 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 it blown up. It was out of proportion, and it also sends a signal to individuals who have gotten out that oh, you can fix your life, you can, you can get your stuff together, but there's going to be a limit to where you can actually get a job, which is part of the problem we have. Those who are formerly incarcerated, the whole band, you know, checking the box and whatever. This is an issue that we face all across this country where people don't want to see formerly incarcerated folks, no matter what crime they commit, get jobs. Yeah, I can only say for myself, I believe in restorative justice and I believe that the justice system can work. Um, and um, I, I believe I, I've shown that. And, you know, again, in my first few days, uh, we are going to, uh, you know, make sure that we're making the best decisions possible. And I will continue to make everybody proud that has supported me. Well, uh, again, congratulations uh, on this historic appointment. Uh, glad to see you there. And you're absolutely right. Not just young girls, uh, not just young black girls, but also young black boys uh, seeing representation on the highest court in the state of Michigan is critically important. Uh, it's unfortunate that we are in 2023 still experiencing first. Uh, but we got that one out of the way, and we definitely hope it is not going to be the last. Yes, and it won't be. <laughs> All right, Justice Kyra <laughs> Bolden, uh, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, folks, um, again, if you want to understand why this show was created for uh, four years ago, almost four and a half years ago, uh, it was for stories like that, for us to be able to have the time and space to talk with uh, a Justice Kyra Bolden. Uh, just the other day, uh, uh, the Washington Post did a story on the brother who was being taken down these Confederate monuments all across the country. Uh, and what was interesting is, um, what was interesting is, people were sending me the story like it was news, and I said, yeah, I talked to him in 2021. And I posted that. And folks are like, well, Roland, you know, some folks may have not seen your show. I said, no, that wasn't the point. The point is, oftentimes, black folks will send stuff around that mainstream media reports on that, that we had already done here on Roland Martin Unfiltered, on the Black Star Network. 
Uh, and so if you want to understand why, why our platforms matter, it's because we're giving voice to folks uh, who aren't necessarily going to be covered. And even when they do get covered by mainstream media, we still bring a different perspective, which is why it is important for us to not only financially support black-owned media, which is why we fight for advertising dollars, but it's also important for us to also share clips from this show and let people know it even exists, because as the first black newspaper Freedoms Journal said, we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. And so we were glad to give an opportunity for Justice Bolden to be able to speak for herself uh, and for our laws to be able to ask her questions as well. Folks, uh, got to go to a break. We come back on Roland Martin Unfiltered. More on the show. We'll talk fitness with Funk uh, Roberts about men over of the age of 40. We'll have our Black and Missing as well. We'll cover some other news of the day. Download the, download the Black Start Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And, of course, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send a check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, R.M. Unfiltered, PayPal is our Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com, and get a copy of my book, White Fear How the Browning of America's Make White Folks Lose Their Minds. Back in a moment. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I got to tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. So people don't really want to have this conversation. No, they don't. on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far-reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Godfrey, the funniest dude on the planet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Israel Houghton. Apparently, the other message I did was not fun enough. So this is fun. You are watching... Roland Martin, my man, unfiltered. All right, folks, black and missing. The Dallas Police Department is looking for a critical missing person. 82-year-old Fred Harrison was last seen walking on January 7th at about 9 a.m. He is 5 feet 11 inches tall, weighs 175 pounds, and is bald with brown eyes. Mr. Harrison was last seen wearing a black jacket and khaki pants. He may be confused and in need of assistance. If you have any information about Fred Harrison, please call the Dallas Police Department at 214-671-4268, 214 671 an Indiana, a former uh, Indiana sergeant has pled guilty to one count of obstruction of justice. In 2018, Muncie Police Sergeant Joseph Crescia responded to the scene of an arrest where multiple uh, officers under his supervision used excessive force against a civilian, resulting in serious injury to 
their face. The day after the arrest, Kresha conducted a supervisory review of the incident, noting that he watched a video and falsely deemed the use of force was justified. He pleaded guilty to one count of obstruction of justice by writing a false report to cover up the excessive use of force by other MPD officers under his command. He is the fourth Muncie Police Department official to plead guilty concerning this investigation. His sentencing is set for June 27th. He faces up to 20 years in prison, a $250,000 fine, uh, and three years of supervised release. The thing here, uh, Scott, that again jumps out, and this is what we talk about all the time. Again, pled guilty to writing a false report and covering up the excessive use. This is the problem. These lying cops when other cops do wrong. Yeah, uh, and it happens all around the country in every prosecutor's office. DOJ could just sit a monitor in each criminal complaint room and just sit there and you could prosecute several, not all, but prosecute several. When I was a prosecutor in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, I used to be in, in criminal complaint room and the police would come in and, you know, we're, we're, we're stuck with the facts that they give us and you go through the paperwork and you see this and it doesn't make sense to you and you cross-examine the police and they've got their story set, they got their lies set, they've been trained up to say it the way they want it to come out. And very oftentimes, prosecutors are just stuck with that story, even if they don't believe it. So either the police have to make it make sense, or you've got to find something to hang your hat on as to why it was a bad arrest. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't, even if it sounds bad to you. And so I'm not surprised. But lastly, think about this, Roland. If DOJ could prosecute these types of cases in every jurisdiction, it would serve as a deterrent to police departments and police officers who think they can lie their way through the thin blue line and get away with it. It would stop it almost immediately, and, and yet we don't have enough resources for that to happen, or we don't have attorney general's offices or DOJ resources to do it in every jurisdiction. It would be a key deterrent to future police brutality cases. Uh, Joe. Well, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem when the people that you rely on for testimony, you're supposed to turn around and prosecute. Until you separate the prosecution of police and put it with either a state's attorney or somebody especially appointed that does not rely on these police officers to keep their 90% yeah. uh, yeah. prosecution rate, um, you're going yep. to continue to have the same problem. In this particular situation, they were perpetuating a lie. One of the people that was being protected by this false report was the chief's son. So, hey, this was all a club. It was all in the gang. And it was about covering up so everybody, including the chief's son, and by, you know, by elimination there and by extension, <laughs> the chief could stay safe. I'm glad that this is happening more often to the point that was just made, if you could do this in every jurisdiction, there'd be enough of it to do. This is not a rare occurrence. Yeah. It continues to happen. Fortunately, people are pleading out a bit more because they're actually getting investigated, right? I would think that even though the U.S. attorneys, et cetera, and the Justice Department is supposed to be non-political, my sense is they have gotten more bandwidth to do the things that they need to do under this administration. So I'm glad for it. Um, I hope that it continues, and I hope that people realize just because you comply. Here's a brother that complied, okay? They told him to do something. He did it. He still got his face smashed in. So you can't tell me that compliance in and of itself is actually going to save you. I'm not telling you that not to comply, but people, you know, come around and say, well, if he had complied, then there wouldn't have been that problem. No, not necessarily. We can go back to the brother in Minnesota and let the cop know that he had a gun and what ended up happening. He was shot three or four seconds later. Again, so when this you... is a real thing, and we keep dealing with it time and time again. And um, this case is not in the script here, but was this, Monique, was this, this was on the federal level. It wasn't on the state level, was it? No, yeah, it's a federal case, but I... I... I guess the, the point where I disagree, where I continue to disagree, is when we, um, on the civil rights side, 
continue to point out the so-called symbiotic relationship between prosecutors uh, and police to the point that they cannot keep their oath and do their jobs. I don't believe that that's true. Uh, and if it is true, that is part of the broken system and the fix for it is not to remove them from their jobs. It is to put people of diverse backgrounds uh, in the jobs, in the communities who will honor the oath as a prosecutor. And, and what happened here uh, is that it was honored, but we've seen Kristen Clark and her team have to go basically sweep the country, as Scott was discussing, and clean up here and there and here and there. And I think what we really need to do, uh, one of the things that needs to happen is that for those of us who never in life wanted to be prosecutors, or even ones like Scott who did, to encourage the young lawyers to be, who are coming behind us, to serve with integrity in that capacity, because that is what we need. We need representation there, the same as we need it every place else. Well, again, uh, the most important thing for me, I'm tired of lying ass cops, and I'll keep saying it. When these cops lie on these damn reports and they're covering stuff up, they got to go. When they're not turning those body cameras on, attempting to cover stuff up, they got to go. If you have a badge and a gun, you have the level of authority that very, very few people have, and that's a sacred trust. And, and look, and I got no, I don't want to hear any from these people like, oh, it's hurting morale. Guess what? Act right, do right, then you don't have to go to jail. That's simple as that. In Philadelphia, we'll folks, in Philadelphia, Department of Prisons sergeant pled guilty to a violation of civil rights and falsification of records related to the use of excessive force of a detainee. See, here we go again. Ronald Granville admitted he strip searched a pretrial detainee at the current uh, front hole correctional facility where he and four other officers physically assaulted the man. The, 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 the detainee was hospitalized with injuries to his face, ribs, and scrotum and had to undergo emergency surgery. The correction officers also falsified records and submitted false reports about the incident. The investigation into the other correction officers' actions is ongoing. Same, he, he, same thing here, uh, 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 Monique. Again, correctional officers covering things up, falsifying records. They are protecting <clears throat> folks, and, and they keep protecting folks. And this is why I keep saying, I'm glad to see the DOJ's, Christian Clark Civil Rights Division, they're not just going after police departments, they're going after, they, they have put a lot of these people in these prisons in prison for how they have treated inmates. Yes, and the, one of the reasons why that, that helps is obviously it is justice. So it's a, it's a function of the Justice Department to have justice met on behalf of uh, these incarcerated citizens who do not have all of their rights and cannot fully defend themselves and count on the government those who are holding them to do it for them. So for that reason, it must be done because their constitutional rights were violated. But the other thing that it does, as my two colleagues have pointed out multiple times tonight, is it serves as a disincentive, it serves as a deterrent against bad behavior. Because even if you have line officers, line correctional facilities officers, who would want to do this, it ends up being the chiefs of police, it ends up being the sergeants who are saying, not on my watch, because the consequences won't just go to you. The heads will roll all the way uphill and back down again. Joe? Yeah, I mean, Monique, listen, I like your idea of what you said before. There's no question that prosecutors ought to be doing the right thing. But most of the time, that's why the federal government is the backstop, right? I mean, these things that we've been talking about today are both DOJ, right? It doesn't happen often enough on the state side, right? And so I would love for us to get to this place where we know that the prosecutors are going to do everything that they need to, but just in, you know, self-survival and enlightened self-interest, these guys are going to be less inclined to convict somebody that they depend on. Because if you convict him, too, how many cases go away with it, right? You know what I mean? And so, you know, it just goes against our enlightened self-interest. It, it, people starting off with the best of intentions, right? And not every prosecutor has the best intentions. They should, but not everyone should. So, I'm again, I'm glad they're doing this. The federal government is a backstop. The DOJ is doing what it is that they're doing. But on the state side, I would still reiterate that, you know, it, when you're dependent on the folks that uh, you need to testify and you have to turn around and, and snitch them out, 
you know, it just doesn't rub the right way, and it doesn't happen often enough. And Scott, Joe's making a great point. Unfortunately, you're not seeing equal justice under law on the state level. For these things to actually get done, it's, it's, it's the federal folks having to step in, and that really shouldn't be the case. Because, they're, because they need independence at the state level, and you don't have that. Whether you put diversity lawyers and prosecutors, they're still relying on these police officers. I, I don't think putting diverse, well-trained folks in there, I think it has to be independent in some way. But this case really bothered me because they stripped this guy and then they beat his ass and, 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 and injured his scrotum. There's some more going on there. I didn't have the police report, but it's got to be one of the most inhumane things to do right. to a human being, to strip them and then beat their ass. And I often wonder, have we interviewed these, these correction officers or police officers? Have they done something so inhumane and say, why did you do it? Yep. What did this guy do? It's never justified. This is inhumane treatment. Easy, because, because they've always gotten away with it. And the American flag. They've always well, gotten away with it. And that's the deal. They've gotten yes. away with it in the past, and now they're being held accountable. Well, but again, these well, the accountability well, should also be on the state level. And too yes, often I'm getting to something else. Too often the, no, head? too often. No, it's it's, it's a it's a so of, it's a beast of power. And too I often add something? too often these DAs will actually hold on, I gotta go to a break. And so we'll pick okay. up on this as we come back. Plus, we'll talk about the San Francisco art gallery owner who just Pour water on a homeless person. Wait till you see this video. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please, support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, the number of people working from home has quadrupled to almost 30%. You're going to learn how you can now create your money space. It can impact your mood, your mindset, and your ability to get wealthy. Interior designer Nikki Kluge joins us to share exactly what you need to do to create a winning workspace. Make a space that is going to instantly put you in the mindset so that you can be more productive, so that you're organized, so that you're inspired, or you're really focusing in on the task at hand. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Cupid, the maker of the Cupid Shuffle and the Wham Dance. What's going on? This is Tobias Trevelyan. And if you're ready, you are listening to and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, before I go to this next term, Monique, you had a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is where uh, the, the new version of organizing and activism and, and strategists are so necessary across legacy organizations and across new ones in that where before we were organizing uh, boycotts and we were organizing around transportation, we can do what international organizations do to entice our young gifted people to go and do mission work overseas, to go and do volunteerism, to go and serve uh, as lawyers, as doctors, you know, all of the organizations that do 
do that. We need that same work in these United States. And it's not the giving of free will. It's not the lack of opportunity. We need a combination of the funding plus the strategy so that these areas that are most precarious for our people have more representation of us in them. And so just in terms of solutions, I would love to see conversations around what we could do to get more of us in these spaces. Well, the thing here, Joe, on that particular point, uh, the reality is, if you go back to when Obama was president, Black Lives Matter, when you get the protest, so many people kept focusing on Washington, D.C. and legislation in Washington, D.C. It was really then people began to realize, wait a minute, we're going to actually change. D.C. has very limited power. Even when it came to police abuse, a lot of people realized during those protests, yeah, we can get federal law, but you got to change the state law, and then you got to change the local prosecutor, and you got to change... And so then, so then you begin to see the shift where a lot of organizing groups begin to realize, yo, we got to start running progressive DAs. The reality is, it's really been only the last, I would say, five, uh, five to eight years, you've seen a much more aggressive push to get progressive district attorneys and also progressive judges... And the funds, the funding behind candidates uh, running for that, because again, so long the emphasis was always on DC, DC, DC. So you have even in what they call liberal cities, right? I mean, you know, just go back and look at uh, the, the the recent documentary with, uh, with 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 Reverend Sharpton, or look at what they're talking about with the you know with uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani and all these other people that were in so-called liberal cities. The police departments were still islands. They were still islands that were not progressive. People that call themselves Democrats in and of itself, that doesn't mean anything. Minneapolis has problems and they're a quote liberal city. LA has problems and they're quote liberal city. And so you do have to have a political movement that is uh, locally based. Even while hopefully your federal government is your backstop, you still need people, certain people in DAs. You need certain people on the city council. You need certain people on the planning commission. It's gonna affect what's built and what's not built. You know what I mean? When people speak in code about the, ex you know, the exclusivity of their cities and, and keeping their charm or whatever else, and they're not trying to build with density that actually helps you uh, deal with cost issues and some of those types of things. You need local folks on every level and particularly as it pertains to things dealing with policing. And so that's the only way that you actually have the chance to affect the change. And the other part that you need is a shame it took George Floyd dying like he did. Sometimes things change when everybody's watching. Uh, you turn on the lights. Uh, speaking, of a damn <laughs> speaking of a damn shame, folks, watch this video here. A San Francisco video has gone viral showing an art gallery owner using a hose to spray a homeless woman in front of his business. Roll it. Art gallery owner uh, Collier Gwynn sprayed the woman during freezing temperatures as she slept outside uh, the Barbarossa Lounge, uh, the uh, rig door to the gallery. Now, the un uh, now, the woman uh, frequented the area and often slept on the sidewalk. Gwen said he tried to help the woman, but she refused his help. The police were called, but both parties refused to press charges. Um, Scott, I, look, <clears throat> we, 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 we're seeing these stories, and we're seeing people complaining in San Francisco and Los Angeles about the homeless crisis in this country. But for you to get a water hose and spray someone like that? The woman was psychotic, too. She's mentally ill. She couldn't comply with his request. And he knew that. It's just so inhumane. I keep getting, what is wrong with people? So how was the hose and spraying her with water going to get her to respond to his command to move away from the art gallery? How was that going to help? this homeless situation or this woman who could be a mother, a daughter, a sister, a friend of any of us who is homeless now and mentally ill. It's a broader issue, broader problem, but this short-term solution by this man, 
He should have been arrested, if you will, for assault, right? He should have been. I don't care who wants to press charges. He should have been arrested. But this is not a short-term solution. And just, just really, really uh, highly inappropriate. Joe? Yeah, I mean, ditto. And I, I forget what locality they're in, but, you know, somebody ought to take that case on the civil side. Okay, somebody ought to take that case on the civil side uh, because yeah, really. that's not something that should be happening under any circumstances at all. And, you know, when you're dealing with the unhoused, you're dealing, you, you have a property owner. As a citizen, you have certain responsibilities, okay? And one of those responsibilities is that you shouldn't be doing harm, even through your frustration and your, your moments where you're trying to run a business and you've got somebody that's psychotic that's sitting in the front of it. The answer is not hosing them down with water. It didn't help. All it did was, got, was, was get him some attention, you know? And, of course, he's unapologetic, and the police should have pressed charges against him as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with power, with property ownership, with citizenship comes certain responsibilities. And you can't just stop over those that are the least of us because your life is inconvenienced because you were trying to open up your storefront in the morning. You call the police, keep a relationship with them, and go down that road. But you don't need to put water on anybody. Monique? Yeah, it's not too late for him to go to jail. And, right. and people need to, right. to be asking that he be arrested for assault and for battery. That is not his property that she's on. Uh, it, it looks clearly to be, like, street domain property. And, yes, she was probably there and not supposed to be. And, yes, they probably could have ticketed her. Ticketed her. And, yes, if he had called the police, they probably could have insisted on her moving to, to wherever because they don't have a place for the unhoused to go. But what he did not have a right to do was that. Uh, and it is all on camera. What would be next? Sicking dogs on her? No, it is, it is, it is unacceptable. And, and it should still be punished. Yeah, Monique, one of the issues for them was she could not be the complaining witness, the homeless woman, because she was psychotic. To arrest in most jurisdictions a misdemeanor, if the police don't observe it, then they have a third-party witness or the complaining witness. Here, you didn't have that. But whoever took the video could have filed a complaint against him, and he would have been arrested for misdemeanor assault charges, whether it's California or anywhere else. For whatever reason, that didn't take place. But you're right, that could still take place here based on the video. But just really, really awful treatment of homeless people. They may be a nuisance and an eyesore, but they don't give up their humanity because they are homeless or poor or disenfranchised. Folks, right, uh, and there are we... a number of jurisdictions now where um, where where assaults are concerned, whether the complaining witness is willing to step forward or not, they are able to do it. I don't know what the law is in that particular jurisdiction, but that is the way it is in Maryland, and not just for domestic cases, um, but for they assault have to and be battery injured, in general. Seriously injured. Gotcha. Well, right, folks, he, he, um, I'm he going, was. I'm, I'm going to the next story here, and that is we've lost a civil rights legend, Cleo Orange. She has passed away. Uh, Cleo was uh, integral to the civil rights movement. She worked with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a staff organizer of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, on, on the Poor People's Campaign. She later married civil rights activist James Orange and remained a staple in the SCLC. Orange continued the fight for social justice uh, with uh, uh, the Reverend Bernice King at the King Center. Uh, Cleo Orange, she passed away of lung disease on January 4th. She survived by her daughters, uh, Tamara, Deidre, son, Cleon. Two of the daughters passed away previously. Uh, she was 78 years old. Uh, also, folks, uh, it's uh, some great news, uh, of course, uh, the, the brother uh, with the uh, Buffalo Bills, uh, who, of course, uh, had the uh, had cardiac arrest uh, in a game a week ago, uh, he's actually been released. Uh, DeMar Hamlin has been released from a Buffalo hospital. Now, remember, he was released yesterday from a Cincinnati hospital, went to a Buffalo hospital. He's now been released. Uh, tests were, comprehensive tests were run. Uh, a series of cardiac, neurological, and vascular testing took place. Uh, and there were no previous conditions. And they, they, they uh, said that uh, it, the, it was the actual, the hit 
uh, that caused the cardiac arrest, not a previous condition, uh, as uh, uh, other cardiac experts had talked about. But it is absolutely uh, awesome and wonderful that this brother, uh, again, folks, uh, it was, uh, you know, what, 10 days ago uh, when he was fighting for his life on the field, and now he has been released uh, from a Buffalo hospital uh, and is headed home. And so uh, Damar Hamlin's family absolutely is elated uh, with that news. He's going to continue re re rehabilitation at home uh, for this. Uh, and the Bills release uh, this statement. Damar Hamlin has been discharged from Buffalo General Medical Center, uh, Gates Vascular Institute, a Kalita Health facility in Buffalo, New York. Hamlin was admitted on Monday and went through a comprehensive medical evaluation as well as a series of cardiac, neurological, and vascular testing on Tuesday. James Natler, MD, critical care physician and chief quality officer at uh, Kalita Health and the care team led uh, for Hamlin said, we have completed a series of tests and evaluations and in consultation with the team physicians, we're confident that DeMar can be safely discharged to continue his rehabilitation at home with the bill. So that is absolutely uh, some great news there. All right, folks, got to go to a break. If you're watching uh, YouTube, hit the like button. Facebook, hit the share button. Uh, comment on the Black Star Network uh, as well, on the app as well. And so uh, we should easily be at 1,000, 1,500 likes on YouTube. And so when I come back, I better see us over 1,000, y'all. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows, and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Coffin. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far reaching First Amendment, that is, freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. It's Kim Whitley. Yo, what's up? This your boy Ice Cube. Hey, yo, Peace World. What's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. So uh, lots of movement happening when it comes to the Senate seat of Dianne Feinstein in California. Earlier this week, uh, Congresswoman Katie Porter publicly announced that she was running for the seat. Well, uh, reporting out now suggests that Congresswoman Barbara Lee told the Congressional Black Caucus in their meetings today that she also was going to run for the seat. Now, she was quoted as saying uh, that... Uh, she was simply informing her colleagues of some different things that may be happening, that she also talked to Feinstein, uh, and that Feinstein um, uh, said uh, that, uh, you know, folks have to make their own decisions. 
Um, was was interesting here, uh, Monique, is that uh, Adam Schiff, Congressman Adam Schiff, was ripping um, uh, Katie Porter for saying, how dare you make this announcement while we have a flooding happening in California. Well, keep in mind, Schiff also wants to go after the seat as well. So you have some political grandstanding right there. And so it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens here. Feinstein is 89 years old, frankly, should have retired uh, six years ago. Uh, and the bottom line, she needs to go. Uh, she needs to make the doggone decision that she's stepping down because, frankly, pass the damn baton. Uh, we got too many of these senators who are way too old. Uh, and again, she slowed down considerably. Let, give the next generation. Now, granted, we say the next generation, Barbara Lee is 71. Uh, but again, that's 18 years younger uh, than Feinstein. But if you look at if you look at Congresswoman Barbara Lee uh, and the 80-year-old Maxine Waters, they moving a hell, lot, hell of a lot faster than Feinstein. Uh, but th this is the, this is the problem too often in politics when one gen generation doesn't understand it's time to go. Look at Debbie Stabenow. She said it. Hey, we have a whole crop of new leaders in Michigan. I'm stepping down uh, in 24 to allow the next generation to come up. Your thoughts on uh, Lee? No, I mean, you you said all of it, and we're, we're not going to lose no matter who wins out of the three that you just named. Those are, are stellar public servants. Would I like uh, there to remain a woman in that seat in the Senate? I don't think that we should we should lose one. Uh, but but no matter what, you know, I think this is one of those things where because uh, Senator Feinstein did not do what um, Nancy Pelosi did in in the speaker position and literally pick her heir, groom her heir gather caucus support around her air and ensure that they just swept through like it was all planned like like a precision well-oiled machine this is not happening that way uh, and so because it is not happening that way it's it's gonna be whoever jumps and and I I look forward to what I think will be healthy and respectful uh, debate about what California deserves in that seat uh, absolutely there all right uh, Scott your thoughts yeah, you know, in the private sector, we talk a lot about succession planning. And sometimes it's painful, sometimes it isn't. Uh, here, unfortunately, uh, it's not clear what Feinstein is going to do. And whatever she does, if she doesn't run, it's going to look like the Democratic Party, who has loved her and she's loved it for so long, that she's being pushed out by the younger generation. And perhaps she is responsible for it because she's taken way too long to determine What's next? She's been in politics yep. at least 60 to 70 years. And so it's unfortunate. The Dems will retain that seat no matter what. But we're a long way from 2024. And uh, uh, Senator Feinstein deserves better, not blaming anybody, but she deserves better for herself and her decision making. But she deserves better from the Democratic Party than to look like she's being forced out. So we'll have to keep an eye on the story. Dude, she ain't being forced out. She's 89. It's time to go. Okay, it's, it's time to go. It's real that, simple. Okay, I'll let, that, she deserves better. No, right. damn it. Sometimes you gotta know. You, sometimes you, to you gotta that know that when it's time that's to leave. Ageist. And guess that's what? It, guess what? You You're might need to get for. Well, that's guess what? what? You You're an age discriminator. No, I'm not. Anybody knows really? she needs to go. It's time to go. Damn it! Sometimes it's time to go home. It's sometimes it's time you take your ass home. All right, listen up. Uh, in Fort Worth, the city council unanimously approved the renaming the recreation <laughs> center after Atiana Jefferson, uh, despite some <laughs> opposition from people who live uh, in the area there. Uh, she was killed by former Fort Worth police officer Aaron Dean. Uh, and, of course, he is currently in prison uh, for her death. And so uh, that action was taken by the Fort Worth Police Department. All right, y'all, I got to go to break. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk with uh, Funk Roberts about fitness for men over the age of 40 and 50. And so we're looking forward to having that conversation as we continue uh, our discussion on a new you in 2023, uh, giving you various advice and counsel from different experts, uh, from fitness folks and dietitians as well. And so we've had some great conversations thus far. And so we look forward to having... Uh, this conversation uh, with Funk as well. Don't forget, folks, support uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered and Black Star Network. Download the Black Star Network app. Uh, we
we available at Apple Phone, Android Phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible to do what we do. Send your check-in money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, the number of people working from home has quadrupled to almost 30% you're going to learn how you can now create your money space. It can impact your mood, your mindset, and your ability to get wealthy. Interior designer Nikki Klu joins us to share exactly what you need to do to create a winning workspace. Make a space that is going to instantly put you in the mindset so that you can be more productive, so that you're organized, so that you're inspired, or you're really focusing in on the task at hand. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, we've had these various segments called a new you in 2023 tie drive fit live win segment. Uh, and we have a variety of people. Uh, and when I was walking along the beaches uh, of Jamaica, the, uh, first of all, there were, there were a number of people who I had not had not had on the show since we had the TV one show. So we've had them on as well. We got more to come. Uh, and then there were some new folks uh, as well. And so 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 the whole idea uh, is offering you a variety of perspectives as we begin 2023. Every, every, every course, every new year, folks begin with resolutions. They say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to start doing something different. Uh, but the key is also having information in terms of what to do. And we're going to be using this show to be reminding you of that. And so it's not just going to be uh, just for this month. Of course, we have our Fit, Live, Win segment every single Monday. Uh, and so we'll be pushing that. And so uh, my next guest really focuses on a men 40 plus, 40, 50, and 60, uh, offering them uh, tips, uh, diet, uh, food information, Work on information. He's a, he, he loves the kettlebell if you follow him on Instagram. Uh, and so uh, Funk Roberts joins us right now. Funk, how you doing? I'm amazing. How are you? Thank you're, you you're, in, you're in Toronto, right? I am. Yep. Yep. Beautiful uh, Canada. All right, then. So, uh, so let, let, let's, let's jump right into it in terms of um, it's, it's so much. There's so much information out here. Uh, and, and, and it's amazing to me if you look at the magazines, you look at video, uh, I mean, like, I, I could be on YouTube and I'll see these ads. You're wasting your time being on the treadmill, being on the elliptical. You should be doing this. No, you shouldn't be eating this. No, you should be doing this. And it's, it, it gets to the point where people are like, damn, you know what? I ain't listening to none of this. I'm just not even going to do anything. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information out there, and information overload's a big, <clears throat> big, big problem. But the thing is, you have to gravitate to somebody 
who's going to show you or teach you how to get fit or healthy based on your age, based on, you know, your, your, uh, your goals. So for me, helping men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s w- was perfect for me. I'm 53. And, you know, when I was younger and, and when I reached 40, I did suffer from low testosterone. I had a big belly and I couldn't figure out how to lose weight. And I didn't know what was happening with now, me. Now, hold on, hold on. I want you to stop right there. How old were you when that happened? 39 years old. So you were 39. 39. Okay, go ahead. So 39 years old, here I am. Still, I was posting videos on YouTube. So I'm this big fitness person. But deep down inside, when I I looked at myself, I still had a big belly. My energy levels were low. Every time I worked out, I'd get injured. And I really started to not feel like the person I was. I kind of felt like I lost my manhood. You know, my sex drive was down and all of these things were happening, but I didn't know what to do. So, of course, the first thing I'm going to do is work out harder, work out more to try to lose the belly fat or jump on all of these different diets. But it wasn't until I went to the doctor and the doctor said to me, hey, man, your testosterone levels are like 190 when they should be at seven, eight, nine hundred. And at that point, I didn't know, like, I didn't correlate testosterone and health and, you know, losing weight. I thought, well, I'm a big guy, 215 pounds, big and puppy. I must have lots of testosterone. But, you know, on the contrary, he told me, listen, man, your testosterone levels of of a grandfather, you need to focus on this. And once I learned the power of increasing your testosterone and what that does for us as men got it it completely transformed my, my so my life. so so when we when we go for these tests these blood tests and things along those lines and people going and, and, and getting their numbers run the thing for you was understanding what your testosterone level was so then let, let's just say it was normal or high so basically then you rule that out but, yeah. for, but, but for you, it was, this is what it was, and then that now then determined what your next step was. For sure. So my next step was, okay, well, I'm glad that I, can, I found out that this was the cause of me not having energy, me not being able to lose belly fat, me not being able to build muscle. So once I started to change my nutrition, change the type of workouts, change and focus a little bit more on the recovery, and really develop a program or system for us guys as we're getting older because when we're get when we get older not only do we suffer from low testosterone our testosterone levels naturally decrease one to two percent every single year after the age of 40 plus we suffer from sarcopenia which is a natural loss of muscle due to aging we do not want to be losing muscle because the more muscle we lose the the the, the weaker we're going to be we're going to be more susceptible to injuries So that's the second thing. And the third thing that happens when we reach 40 is our metabolism slows down. And that's not done naturally, but that's just due to our lifestyle. So once I realized that there are certain things we can put into place, specific workouts, specific nutrition system, specific recovery uh, protocols, focusing on sleep, my body completely transformed, my health completely transformed, and my 40s were better than you know, my 20s and my 30s, and I was a professional athlete back back when I was younger. And so that's when I decided to implement this on other men over 40. 10,000 plus men are transforming their lives using this system. Now, you just said something there when you said diet, when you said working out, different workouts, you said sleep. 100%. So the very first, you know, there's a lot of pillars that we need to focus on. So the first the easiest one we can focus on is sleep because sleep, uh, getting seven to nine hours sleep is crucial, not only for our hormones, so helping testosterone, increasing our testosterone levels. Testosterone production happens overnight when we're sleeping and in the morning, that's when our testosterone levels are the highest. So if we're not getting seven to nine hours sleep every night or, or striving for that, then we're doing our hormones a disservice. Plus, when we're working out in the gym, whether it's body weight, whether it's with dumbbells, whether it's whether it's with kettlebells, we're trying to build muscle. But muscle isn't built in the gym. We're actually breaking down muscle. So during sleep, that's the time we're gonna our muscles are gonna recover, get stronger, and allow us to get prepared for our next workout or what we're doing the next day. And of course, we know that when we have better sleep, our energy levels are higher, our brain functions better. It's just overall the 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 
you know, the, the shortest thing that we can do and focus on that will give us the biggest results. Uh, and see, and look, I mean, the reality is we're now living in a world where, look, I remember growing up uh, in Texas, you, we had the blue laws uh, where stores were not open on Sundays. Uh, now, all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, I remember when the laws change and uh, then they open. Uh, and now stores open earlier. Now you got 24 hours. Now you have uh, folks who, uh, where essentially they're working seven days a week. Uh, and and one of the things, uh, one of the things when I was um, when I was uh, in Jamaica, and I, I was tweeting, I was posting, I call this this shedding, shredding, and cleansing process. Where really what I was doing, I was thinking about everything. I was thinking about personally, personal relationships, professional relationships thinking about the business, every person who works with the business, partners I work with. I was examining every single thing. Uh, and, and one of the things I, I did before I actually, um, uh, before I actually uh, left, I got, I got this uh, sleep ring because that was one of the things. For the longest, I operated off of anywhere from three to five hours sleep. Uh, and, and I'm talking about high performing, I could go 16, 18 hours. And one of the things that I said was, going in 2023, I said I had too many people who have access to me, people who were texting me, calling me late night, early in the morning. Uh, I started saying, fine, you want to meet with me? You got to go through my assistant. And so really creating sort of uh, these firewalls to protect the time because it takes me so long. My brain is moving so fast that literally... If, if, I'm doing any, if I'm doing any work after 10, 30, 11, it's probably going to be four hours before I can actually go to sleep because my brain is moving. And so I had to actually change when I leave here what I do after work. And I say, fine, if, 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 if you want to talk to me, and I ain't talking to everybody, but I'll talk to the folks between 9 and 10. But once 10 o'clock hits, I was forcing myself to come down in order to hit that six, seven hour uh, sleep uh, mark. Yeah, I mean, listen, I know that you mentioned that you were high functioning with four to five hours, but really and truly, if you look at it, imagine if you had seven to nine hours sleep every day and how much more you could do. And it's about sustainability. Well, first right? of all, that yeah. first of all, uh, Funk, that's scary. If you know how I perform, that's real scary with that seven to nine, trust me. Uh, but go ahead. So. It's like it's like uh, you know you're at a circus and you see the guy or girl uh, with the with the with the plates right spinning the plates. Sure, they can spin the plates for so long, but at some point those plates are going to fall. So yes, maybe you can get away with this for a certain amount of time, but it only will catch up to you at some point where your immune system breaks down, where you know maybe you get some some unfor unfortunate chronic health issues. It's just about treating your body and your health uh, at, at, the, at, at its peak, right? Really and truly focusing on that. So I like the fact that you're setting, setting boundaries for your sleep, and that's good. Uh, you know, obviously, it's not going to turn over right away, but once you start to set those boundaries and focus right. on, you know, getting enough sleep, then it's about hormones too, right? Because your hormones, if you went and got some blood work and got hormone uh, checks, uh, you know, you may see something that... Uh, you know, may, may alarm you. Uh, absolutely. All right, so hold tight one second. I'm going to go to a break. We come back. We got questions for our, uh, our panel. Uh, folks, uh, hit, be sure to uh, hit us up. Uh, I see you all in the chat room as well. I see your uh, questions and comments. Uh, pull up Funk's information. If you want to follow uh, Funk Roberts, uh, you can follow him on social media. Instagram, Funk Roberts Fitness. Uh, not the .com, y'all. It's at Funk Roberts Fitness. The website is over40shred.com. His email is there, funkroberts at gmail.com. And, of course, his supplements are at funksupplements.com. Don't forget, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also, of course, join our Bring the Funk fan club, uh, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollinsmartin.com, rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available at various bookstores. Target, Books A Million. Download the book through Audible or order through your favorite black bookstore. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. 
As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. People think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows, and that are still painting us as Monoliths. The people don't really want to have this conversation. No, they don't. Hello, everyone. It's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And, and we're SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We're talking with uh, Funk Roberts uh, about uh, his uh, work up plan for men 40, 50, and 60. Uh, since Scott is always whining and complaining, he doesn't get the first question. I guess I'll let you ask the first question today, Kappa Man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, hey, you know, one of the things that's so important is making these choices in our life. You know, for busy folks in 40s, 50s, and 60s, there are a lot of things, a lot of stress factors, a lot of choices you could make, whether it's to generate income or take care of your health. And you know all the downsides when you don't choose health over money or over stress or representing clients and what have you. Um, how, do you how do you psychologically, you know, kind of force yourself to say, I've got to take care of my body because if I don't do a better job at it in my 40s, 50s, and 60s, all the other stuff I'm doing to make money won't really matter. And I'm going to leave this earth early if I don't prioritize my body. But so often, many of us continue to make the choice of working, uh, representing clients, making money, and we'll get to that health issue later. Any, any commentary yeah. on those choices, those bad and good choices? Absolutely. You made a very uh, good point. Uh, it, it boils down to value systems. We all have different value systems. Like you said, some value work, some value making money, some people, some value their family or maybe coaching. Or for me uh, and my wife, we value health and fitness. So not everyone's mm -hmm. going to have that at the top of their value system. The thing is, no matter what you value, your health has to come first. If you're not healthy, you won't be able to uh, uh, excel in whatever you want to do. So I have businesses. I have three or four different businesses, seven-figure businesses. And mm -hmm. if I'm not healthy, if I'm not focusing on keeping stress levels down, if I'm not focused on ensuring I get a workout in or do some mobility, if I'm not uh, you know, focusing on nutrition, ensuring that I'm fueling my body, what it needs for my brain to, to function at its peak, for my body to function at its peak, for energy to function at its peak, then I cannot do the things I want to do at the level I want to do it at. And like you said, you're going to leave here er too early, not leaving the legacy yeah. that you need for yourself or your family. And it was something that you could have avoided by focusing and putting your health and fitness first. 
doesn't have to be, you know, the, the gap doesn't have to be too long. It's just about re, refocusing and, and putting together a plan that works with both. You know, uh -huh. wake up in the morning, do five minutes of, of a workout, making sure that you're planning your meals. But the meals that you're eating, the food that you're eating is good, healthy foods. Well, it doesn't matter to make all that money then if you can't enjoy it. Uh, Joe. So, Brother Baldwin asked a very deep question, you know, that allowed us to talk about value systems and everything like this. But but I'm simple. So here's mine right here. How do I do the kettlebell without throwing my back out? <laughs> <laughs> my back, you know, I, I, I threw it out pretty good once or twice. And over the years, I just wasn't stretching. And I do have a, have a trainer now. But that kettlebell... You know, I, I know it's good for you, but I have to make sure I have to be real careful to make sure I don't screw it up. And, and in general, too, talk a little bit about back health and how you do those things that help to strengthen your back and the muscles around your back. That's singing my song. Absolutely. So first and foremost, before you touch the kettlebell, we got to backpedal and do a little body weight work so that you can at least know how to move your body using your own body weight with your exercises. Then you move to the dumbbell. And of course, when you get to kettlebell training, you it's, it's a skill. So you have to have, you have to learn how to use it. You have to practice using it so that you can get the benefits of what kettlebells can bring. But you, you brought up a great point when it comes to back health, because I also have, or have had back injuries in the past. And so as we get older, we don't recover the way we used to. When we were in our 20s, we could work out four, five, six days a week, go to the gym, uh, go to work, go out at night, eat whatever we wanted to, and pretty, you know, it, we could pretty much recover better than we can now. But as we get older, it's less about the workouts and more about recovery. So don't get me wrong. You still have to get those workouts in, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, but it's the recovery piece, the mobility piece, the core training. So some of the ways you can strengthen the back is – First and foremost, core work. You guys hear this all the time, but ensuring that after your workouts, you spend five to 10 minutes on ab or core training. Uh, also, mobility. So making sure that you have that mobility, opening up the body, because we are so crunched over all the time, right? Our, uh, we're, we're on our computers, we're at our car, uh, we're on our phones. We need to open up your body. And, you know, generally speaking, if you have lower back issues, it may not just be the lower back unless it's something traumatic. It's more about glutes. We have to we have to activate those glutes, get the glutes working. So to, that's one of the biggest parts, muscles in our body are in the glutes. Not the biggest, but a lot of muscles are in our glutes. Gotcha. And because we're sitting all the time or we don't know how to activate it, our lower back is starting to t takes the brunt of a lot of the things that we're doing, the movements, everyday functional movement, let alone what we do in the gym. So mobility, yoga, uh, uh, you know, core work, those are, those are key pillars actually in my program. Uh, you know, I make these guys do this because I know that the recovery piece is important and I don't want them to get injured. The last thing I want are the guys in my program getting injured, you know, two, three years down the road when the recovery piece is going to be the key. So, yes, definitely mobility has to be part of your overall health and fitness. But you'll feel better. You'll feel better overall. I got two and a half minutes left. Uh, Monique, go. Hi, Funk. Hey, Monique. How are you? Good to see you. Uh I'm really great. Uh, I'm so glad that people are getting this information from you. I have a question about uh, women who love their men because we have fathers and brothers and, and husbands and sons who we know need what you can provide but might not know the right way um, to put the opportunity in front of them without raising up the the negative side of the alpha that will poo-poo it because we tried to say it. So, you know, I lucked out with you my first two times. Monique, we ain't um, got that much time. We got, Monique, influence. we ain't got that much time. He got to answer the question. <laughs> okay, right. but don't talk. So I want to know what we can do, what you suggest we can do, ways that we can get you, your program in front of the men we love or vice versa. Got it. 
fuck, go. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's really and truly just telling the men you love how much you love them and how much you want them to be healthy, how much you, you value them as the men in your life and how you want them to be healthy. And so without... You know, nagging, it's just, listen, I want to do everything I can to help you get healthy. Let's go to the doctor and get, get some blood work done. Um, you know, I have a, I, there's a program out there that, you know, uh, you should at least take a look at uh, that's specific for men. You know, it's about the support because you're totally right. Sometimes we can take that as a negative thing. What, I don't look good? I don't feel good? But in, in general, it's all about just feeling it's the love that we actually gotcha. need. Yeah, to, to do this. <laughs> uh, folks, pull up Funk's information, please. Uh, I'm almost out of time. Again, this is where you can reach Funk. Uh, Funk Roberts Fitness on Instagram, over40shred.com. His email is there, plus funksupplements.com. Funk, man, I appreciate it. Thanks for your great information. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Take care, everybody. All right, folks, speaking of living long, shout out to uh, one of the three Tulsa uh, race war survivors, uh, Van Ellis, y'all. Of course, remember, we were kicking it uh, with uh, Red, Uncle Red. Uh, he turned 102 years old today. I would often see him on the Tom Jordan Morning Show cruise, Fantastic Voyage, dancing uh, at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, he was all, even, even, even with his walker, he was getting it going. And so, uh, Uncle Red, Turns 102 today. Happy, happy birthday. Folks, that is it for us. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, Joe, Monique, uh, Scott, thank you so very much for being on our panel. We appreciate that. Folks, tomorrow I'll be broadcasting live from Houston outside of the Houston Independent School District uh, where they're trying to fire the principal at Jack Hayes High School, Tiffany uh, uh, Guillory. She's been an amazing job. They won't explain to the community why they're doing it. And so we're going to be broadcasting from there. I'm going to be speaking to the school board there as well, uh, protesting uh, that decision. It is on their agenda. We're going to try to stop it from happening. So I'll be in Houston tomorrow. I'll be back in studio on Friday. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone. Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Join our Brenda Funk fan club. Check in money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Thanks a bunch. I'll see you tomorrow. Ho! Thank mm-hmm. you.